Uh, welcome back to Think Tech. This is Jay Fidel. Um, today we're talking about the middle way. And uh, on this show, uh, we're going to talk about expert opinions regarding in international travel, which is very important now in the prospect of a full, full-throated full reopening. Um, and uh, my co-host is uh, Chang Wan uh, in Minneapolis. And uh, we have Rick King, who is with the MAC, which you'll learn much more about in a minute. So, uh, Chang, how about introducing Rick and giving us a, a handle on the scope of our discussion? Thank you, Jay, and welcome, Rick. It's our distinguished honor to have you here with us today to talk about the international travel from expert uh, perspective. And it's it's not easy for me to introduce Rick, but I first I want to quote uh, an article I authored years ago when I. Uh, a correspondent asked me about Rick, and I just uh, uh, responded to, uh, of the following statement. Rick King is a senior business executive with profound intelligence, superb management skills, and a tremendous integrity. In short, he's a wise man with a big heart who teaches me modesty, honesty, empathy, compassion, confidence, patience, tolerance, and professionalism. I'm saying that with my full heart because I had the privilege and the fortune to work for Rick for 12 years. And currently, Rick is a chair of Metropolitan Airports Commission, the MAC, and also he's on the board of Minnesota Public Radio, on the board of Huntington Banshear TCF Bank, on the board of Minnesota Technology Council, and in many, many other roles. But most importantly, he's, he's, he is a pilot. It's, a, it's, a, it's very enthusiastic about uh, flying. And uh, so I think he got his dream job to manage the airports. And, uh, I, and I, like me, uh, Rick is also a global traveler. He's uh, traveled many, many countries. But uh, like the rest of us for the past two years, we've been pretty much confined in our house. So that's the reason we want to invite Rick both as a global traveler but also a chair of the MAC to share with he to share with us his observation, reflection, and prediction on the international travel in the coming months. Back to you, Jay. Okay, Rick, you, you get to, you get the opportunity to rebut all of that. Well, I have to say that there's a very generous introduction by my fine friend. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know what to say. Um, <laughs> rebuttal might go longer than your show. <laughs> no, thank you, thank you, Chang, and uh, thanks for coming, Rick. So let's let's talk about um, you know COVID. We are in the reopening now, and a lot of people. I and mean, it's hard to say what the demographics are, but I feel that we're in a reopening where they can be confident to travel again, uh, where they don't mind making a reservation, getting on a plane, and even sitting next to people. And going places, and that's happening. Uh, the holidays bear it out every time. Uh, here we have July 4th coming up. I'm sure there'll be plenty of traffic for that. So can you comment on the reopening as far as air travel is concerned and as far as the MAC is concerned? Yes, yeah, so let me first say uh, thank you for having me on. The, the, the MAC, the Metropolitan Airport Commission, uh, is a state agency, um, quasi-agency. It's actually a public corporation that runs uh, great, uh, the MSP Air, International Airport, as well as six reliever airports. So it's an airport authority. Uh, members are appointed, one each by the mayor of Minneapolis and mayor of St. Paul, and, and there are 13 members appointed by the governor. So um, this focus of this group is to manage the airport, and the big airport, of course, is MSP. And MSP suffered mightily uh, in in that uh, March day when when uh, air traffic pretty much shut off in 2020. Uh, we were um, in for a booming year of, a, we had a booming year in uh, 2019. We we're heading for the same thing in 2020 until COVID hit. Things are looking up right now. Um, what we have seen over the last several months, particularly since the vaccinations have become more uh, profoundly spread across the population. So personal travel, leisure travel, has come up mightily. And we're seeing people all around the airport wanting to go to tourist destinations, 
They're somewhat limited by that. We'll get into it because they're looking more domestically and things are starting to open in a couple of countries that people go to. But I'll give you a, a, an interesting fact. Alaska has seen a tourist boom because, of course, they're in the, the, the greater 50 states, as is the state of Hawaii, where you are. And people want to go there because a lot of times they haven't been there. They're looking for some place to go. It doesn't have as many complications as going somewhere um, in Europe or even to Hawaii until very recently had a lot of restrictions in terms of quarantine and testing and so forth. And thankfully to try to protect people there. So not being critical about that, but those restrictions certainly hurt um, what's happening in the tourist industry, not only in Hawaii during the time, but also around the rest of the world. So what we've seen, Jay, is a big, big increase. We now, though, even with that increase in personal travel, are probably about 75% of where we were in 2019 relative to passengers. So we're still not back where we were. Many people are predicting that the holidays will continue. We've got July 4th, you've got Labor Day. After Labor Day, businesses are allegedly going to be increasing their travel. We'll see some things come back a little bit. But in the fall, until you get to the holidays, um, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and so forth, you see a bit of a drop off in travel naturally in the seasonal patterns. And then, of course, the first quarter of every year after the holidays is kind of a rough time, usually for travel. So I think we're going to see the tradition uh, be just like it has been, but will be slightly below the peak levels that we've been in. Hmm. So um, what what is the uh, experience of the traveler um, going through the airport and getting on the plane? I mean, what what restrictions uh, are imposed in, in your airports? And what? And I'm afraid to say I don't know what restrictions are imposed by the airlines these days. What's the experience like, like vis-a-vis -vis, um, the restrictions of COVID? So the, the current restrictions in most of the airports in the United States are, are pretty simply said. The CDC provides an advisory and the TSA has a mask rule in place for all airports and airlines through September 13th. Whether they're going to extend that or not, at this point, we really don't know. So if you're in an airport in the US, you have to wear a mask. If you're on a plane in the US, you have to wear a mask. And it's the TSA's authority that is dictating that. During various parts of COVID, and this would be more in the past, states had mask regulations that were out there for state locations that included the airport. And many airports, including MSP, had their own mask regulations. More and more of those orders have been taken away because we're now relying on the CDC who advises the TSA. My prediction will be that, uh, that depending on what happens with these new variants that are out there, I think the TSA might have been poised to move that order take that away as we get close to September 13th. But with the variants picking up, all bets could be off. Yeah, well, there was an article in the Times this morning about how, um, and this is what Tony Fauci has been saying the last few days, is the existing vaccines, uh, even in a cocktail combination of vaccines, are um, mostly useful against the variants. So we may we may have a problem. It's not that serious going forward. And the question is whether you know when and whether this pervades the public conversation so that people can develop an opinion about it. Um, but I'm I'm wondering also now you had a period of and well even from this discussion nearly a year uh, where you were subject to a public uh, lack of confidence, public concern about flying and being in public spaces in general. And I wonder how that affected the operation of the airports uh, in the uh, MAC. Uh, you must have had a shrink staff. You must have had uh, to um, you know, limit access. What, what did you do uh, to comport with um, the changes in that period? Well, you're absolutely right, Jay. And the, the job of the airport authority is uh, to also sign up all the restaurateurs, all of the newsstands, all of the people that do retail commerce, the rental car companies, um, you 
deal with the parking revenue. So if you think about where all the money that is revenue to the airport authority that it spends on improving the airport comes from, it, it dropped through the floor. And it, it not only affects the airport itself, but it affects all these vendors. There are approximately 600 employees of the airport authority around the system. There are 20,000 people that make their living working at the airport at one of these entities. Uh, so it affects employment. A lot of those groups had to lay off people, furlough people, airlines included, food service, and so forth. And the MAC very carefully went through its budget, um, didn't fill any jobs for a long time, did um, a lot of different techniques that you would use to try to prevent any kind of layoffs. We were able to not do any layoffs, but uh, that was probably because of the tightness of some of the things that we did, but also the fact that the federal government came in with some aid packages. And we were able to meet our bond payments with that. And then we were able to share some of the money that the federal uh, agent, uh, federal government provided us with these entities, air, 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 uh, airlines and food service and others, so that they would be able to sustain themselves until the day we could come back with them. Yeah, just a, a side point. Uh, you've been following, I guess, the infrastructure bill wending its way, hopefully, through Congress. Actually, bills, I should say, wending their way through Congress. Uh, the question, does any of that fall um, you know, for you? Will you get anything from the infrastructure bill? You are mainstream infrastructure, for sure. That's true. There is, there is money. Uh, the money in the infrastructure bills goes to uh, the FAA that then does grants that you do construction off of, and you do construction with your own money, you run projects with your own money, you run projects with FAA grant money, and you run projects with um, with fees that are on the airline ticket. Those are called PFCs. So you get money through those mechanisms, and we draw money from these vendors, uh, percent of what they, their retail take is, and you use that to operate the airport. and different parts of it. For example, an inbound roadway might be part of construction that the federal government will pay for. But if you need to get a new gate, that might be something that you have to build on your own and you ultimately charge the airlines in more of a rental scenario once it's up and, and going. In the infrastructure bill, there are some um, improvements for airports out there. And I do want to say the three rounds of uh, federal aid that came during the pandemic were very helpful to allowing the airport and the people that make their money off the airport to sustain themselves and be here to rebuild as, as traffic picks up. What an exciting ride for you. I mean, I guess it started off as a dream job and then it was um, a complex dream job, that's all, uh, but very challenging for sure. So here you are now. At 75% of the traffic you had in 2019. Um, and I guess my question is what, you know, what is the ramp up like? What are you doing to meet the additional demand, the additional service? Um, and you know, are people doing the same kinds of travel they were doing before, or is it different? Well, let me start uh, with part of the question you asked before, and I don't think I quite got to it. The thing that we needed to do during COVID was demonstrate to the traveling public, the limited traveling public, that we were a safe place to go. So you want to create an, uh, every opportunity to be safe, healthy, and so forth. And what we created was a program that we called Travel Confidently. We talked about masks, sanitation, sanitary uh, hand uh, cleaning, all those things that you do as touchless as you could be. You could order food, it could be delivered by a, a robot, fewer touches. Uh, you had lots of markers about space, uh, separation. You did different designs in your, in your lobby. Rather than trying to get as many people into the line as you could, you had to get people six feet apart. We gave away masks um, as much as we could, and airlines and other partners worked at putting up plexiglass partitions and things like that. So much of that 
right now, including the masks, the touchless activity in terms of either uh, the, the restrooms or the food ordering will continue. And I think they're actually good improvements from a, from a health point of view for everybody as we even come out of COVID. I think what you see is less of the six foot distancing now, but you're of course, uh, as I said earlier, by the TSA order still wearing masks. Airlines that for a while, a couple of them, uh, including one that is the dominant airline here, uh, Delta Airlines blocked middle seats for a whole period of time. They stopped doing that in May of, uh, of this, this year. So you're starting to see some of those things come back into a more normal state. What is not normal when you walk through the airport is seeing everybody wearing a mask. And I think the other thing that's not normal, and you read a lot about this, is people seem to be on the edge of emotionalism when they're on flights these days. We've seen lots of different examples of people getting a little bit out of control. And, you know, we'd all probably like to say, well, I, they just had one too many to drink. But the fact is, it's not related to that. It just seems like people were cooped up for a long time. And they're kind of letting loose in ways that we all wish they wouldn't. I am sad, saddened to say that all, some flight attendants and flight personnel have been injured in the process. Passengers have been arrested. There's numerous passengers, and this is nationwide, put on no-fly lists, things like that. I think it's part of the coming out from being uh, quarantined, I'm afraid. And I don't see a lot of that at MSP, but we're no... Uh, you know, we're no, we're no island to those kinds of behaviors. Yeah, interesting. So, uh, Chang, let's turn to you for a minute and uh, ask you about your aspirations for international travel and your observations as to uh, whether international travel is like it was. Uh, we've had geopolitical changes, the diplomatic changes, foreign policy changes that may affect things, um, both in Europe and Asia. Um, so how do you see international travel for yourself and, and people with whom you deal? I can only speak as a regular traveler. I'm not an expert uh, of airports or airline. But uh, uh, for the past two years, all the travel I have scheduled for international has been canceled or postponed. Now the biggest problem is not only the difficulty in logistics of travel, but also foreign relations and also a visa. It, uh, it, foreign citizens will have a very difficult time to obtain a visa to enter certain countries. And let uh, not mention the mandatory quarantine. So inter and, uh, and there are so many man-made rules put in place to intentionally make international travel intimidating and difficult. So, uh, so the, the less international travel, the, some country will feel more secure. That's quite unfortunate, but uh, we can all understand with the Delta variant and with the Gamma variant, and many countries do not have Pfizer vaccine, do not have Moderna vaccine, they're so scared. There was a Wall Street Journal article uh, a few days ago that uh, China will close down its border to all foreigners until the end of 2022. And that could be not only true for China, but for many other countries. And Europe is temporarily open to the United Americans, but uh, I, I thought this will last long. And Rick mentioned to me that uh, he expects some issues in other parts of the country, uh, other parts of the world as well, not only difficulty in traveling to Asia, country, Asian countries, but also might be other parts of the, the world might be go back to more restricted measures. Like instead of we are on the, we feel like we are on the right path to reopen, but uh, what's going to happen in the next few months, we have no idea. I'm going to just uh, uh, leave this to Rick to share his comments. Yeah, Rick, oh, you know, I'm really interested in your thoughts about this. I imagine uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul is an international hub, um, especially if, if uh, you know, serviced by Delta. And um, you, you're going to have um, a certain amount of, a certain percentage of traffic as international traffic. 
And so how, how has COVID affected that? How is it affecting it now? Um, what is the recovery like? And gee whiz, the, the problems that Chang described sound pretty profound. How are you dealing with that? How is the traveling public dealing with that? Well, the traveling public, let's say, is very anxious to get back to uh, international travel. Um, unfortunately, it's going to take a while, as Chang mentioned here. I would I would have some advice for people on it, and during that, I can also talk about some of the countries that and what they're doing. But things in international travel change almost every day, so it's a good idea to really, if you're planning something, check out the CDC site, check out the airline site, and understand what a given destination has in store for you. A lot of the airlines have interactive maps where you can look at what's what is the requirement to get into a particular destination. So first thing I do is check CDC for your destination. Then I look up the entry requirements for your destination. Um, make sure you've digitally scanned your proof of vaccination, that little flimsy cardboard piece of paper you got from the US. I like to put it uh, scan it right into the notes version in my iPhone so I can have it there pretty well. Some uh, places like Sam's Club and Walgreens actually have something called a health pass by the company called Clear, which also does some of the airport TSA um, proof of ID entry. Um, if you're if you got your test from them, you can use that app. Travel is extremely flexible internationally, so make sure you've got good refundable fares because you never know what's going to go on. And then there's places where you can get an expedited check-in, places like American, Aer Lingus, BA, uh, Iberia. By the way, uh, BA, Aer Lingus, and Iberia are all part of one airline group, and then Japan Air, along with American, is part of that uh, one of the airline alliances, they use something called a Verify Health Passport. So that's something that those airlines have been together to use that they're trying to make it easier for you to get through the jungle of each of these countries. Um, and then when you come back to the U.S., by the way, U.S. still requires a test before you come back in, um, even if you've been vaccinated. So a lot you got to plan for your return test when you leave and there are at home tests that you can actually buy and take with you which is a lot better than uh, perhaps trying to find it wherever you go that said that said some of the eu nations today are open croatia france germany greece iceland italy the netherlands portugal and spain they'll take you as citizens that have been vaccinated um, in and they have varying requirements about testing and stuff like that. They're not closed. Many, many countries are still closed. Caribbean nations, many of them are open. I could go through the list there. Mexico is open. Canada is not open. So it there's a there's a mishmash of things going around. Um, many people ask about the UK and the EU countries. Um, EU countries just remove the ban on travel to the U.S., uh, but you have to go through uh, or travel from the U.S., rather, uh, but you still have to go through whatever their specific regime is when you get there in documentation and um, quarantine in some cases and still test when you go back. The U.K. still has a stringent testing and quarantine right now. So that's disappointing for a lot of people. And these were the places everybody wanted to have open, including them, for Americans to come and visit. I would say pick your place carefully, um, study a lot, and figure out where you want to go, and be prepared to check right before you leave because things change a lot. Well, you know, it strikes me that there's a lot of a lot of room for error on the part of the individual traveler that he didn't or she didn't read it carefully, didn't get the right test, uh, doesn't have the right proof. Um, you know, he can make a list of all the possible footfalls in here. And I imagine as the guy who oversees the operations of these airports, 
uh, you have a certain number of people who come to you or, or to your uh, middle, middle management on a given day uh, reporting that uh, Joe Dokes is stuck. He can't get on his flight. He's sitting there in the airport and he doesn't know what to do. What do we do for him? Is this true? And what, what do you do for him? Well, that does, that does happen. Um, it's, in a sense, it's very similar to people who actually go to a foreign country without the proper paperwork, whether it's a passport or a visa for that country. And basically, they're not allowed in the country. So they're in this, I'll call it no man's land. They left where they left. They arrived where they arrived, but they're not admitted in. They usually get sent back. So they sit at, at whose expense, Rick? Now, the airlines are required to send them back. And the reason for that is on the visa side, the, the, uh, the government in the United States made it the responsibility of the airlines to ensure that those people had the right paperwork to enter in the country to which they were flying. So we don't see that sophistication quite yet with what we're doing here today on uh, on the virus passports but i think i think they're going to be sent back and i think it's going to be on their dime uh not on the airline's dime and they could actually be stuck in a quarantine uh facility for people uh before they can actually get the reservation and get out of that country that they weren't allowed into. You know, this, this all suggests, uh, putting it together with you and Shanger saying, uh, especially about China, you know, limiting or <clears throat> cutting off uh, visits uh, through, what, the end of 2022. That's a long time. That's 18 months. And, um, this, is, this has to be a substantial amount of the missing 25% of air travel for you. Um, and uh, it also suggests that going forward, and the big question is a lot of these, a lot of these problems, a lot of these solutions, if you will, are going to stay in place for a while. And that the uh, the impact that COVID had in the first uh, 18 months um, will continue. And um, you know, uh, the MAC will have to deal with that going forward and make plans for a continuation of, in many ways, the status quo for an in, in, indefinite period of time. Am I right? And, and how has all of that changed the way airports, not only MSP, but other airports in the country, will work going forward? Well, I think you're right that you have to really think about it, because um, I think if we thought domestic was going to recover uh, with business travel in the second half of the year or the early part of 22, and you might be at full capacity relative to your domestic travel with business and personal back, uh, international is going to lag a bit. I think we'll see um, the EU come on pretty strong, and maybe the, that'll be toward normal in 22. And as Chang said, I think we might be a year off for, um, for things in Asia, which is going to be really difficult. So. In the meantime, I think what we have to do is we have to, we've got some revenue associated with those things. So what we have to do is trim our belt and that makes it harder to pick the construction projects or the other projects that you're doing around the airport. So some of those things get delayed. So you make, you know, have the ability to balance the books. And I think you, you are always ready to pounce if, uh, if suddenly we declare that you know, the virus is done and gone and the uh, Asia's open. You want to be able to be the first uh, to be able to jump on that. But meanwhile, you want to be the safest place that people can fly whatever the destination is. And that's how you make your name in this time. Yeah, you bet. It's a time to be observant, a time to be safe, and a time to be nimble, not only in the management of airports, but everything. So, uh, Chang, this is your opportunity to summarize our conversation here today. <clears throat> and I suppose to come up with some suggestions for the traveler. Uh, and if you want, suggestions for Rick, too. Well, the, I, I, I'm not sure I'm in the position to make suggestions to Rick or other travelers. First, I want to thank you, Rio and Rick, to share your thoughts and uh, terrific questions and terrific 
answers about international travel and the airports. Uh, I had the for I had the privilege to visit it at my ZP and Mac. I brought my student to Rick's and office. I was uh, constantly amazed by the great work Mac has been doing, and also. Uh, um, MSP is my favorite airport in the world. To be honest, it's uh, I, I like many other airports, but uh, MSP is definitely the most user-friendly airports, the most comfortable uh, airports you can imagine. You know, I cannot wait the day I can be back on the road. But in terms of the international travel, I would definitely follow all the advice Rick provided, and each one of them is very practical and very useful. But for me personally, I just cannot. I just need to go back to China. That uh, I, I I can cancel my uh, my other travel, domestic, international to to our European countries. But I definitely definitely need to go back to China. But uh, uh, in, in it's not. It's just a tremendously difficult for the past few years uh, when the rhetoric has been heated between two countries. We imagined many, many different best worst scenarios, the war, diplomatic breakdown. But the one thing we didn't expect is a pandemic, which is, is that just uh, end multiple layers of difficulty to the other things already uh, not going well. And the quarantine, the, the testing, all of that. But uh, I think that I, I remember Rick has been advised, uh, has been told me always keep your positivity, always think positively. So I was think positive. I think we cannot go any lower in terms of travel between Asia and the United States. And going forward, we probably can only go better. So that's my <laughs> final thought. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good. So Rick, uh, you, you have the last word here. Um, what would you like to leave as a message with our viewers? Well, I think despite what we've talked about, travel in in the United States is safe. People are taking the right precautions. So you go to the airport where be prepared to wear a mask in your airport, in your flights. Don't be afraid to take the flights. The airlines and all the airport workers have prepared to make it safe for you. So you can get back to seeing people. If your parents are around in the United States, unlike Chung's, you'll be able to go visit him. And I hope he gets to China really, really soon. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. Thank you, Thank you Rick King of the MAC and Chang Wang, my, uh, my co-contributor, co-host in this program. Thank you for organizing this. Greatly appreciate the discussion today. Thank uh, you. Thank you both.